Hello and welcome to this video on demography, migration, immigration and emigration. Following on from the previous video, in addition to natural change such as birth and death, the other factor affecting the size and age of a population is migration. And by migration we mean the movement of people from place to place and this can be both internal, so that's within a country, so within the UK that could be, say, moving from Manchester to London, or external, moving from one country to another, say, moving from the UK to France. We also need to break down this concept of migration into two different ideas. So firstly, immigration, which is movement into a society, and emigration, which is movement out of a society. So depending on which society you're in, and if someone is moving into your society or leaving it, you'll either refer to them as an immigrant or an emigrant. We also need to be aware of the concept of net migration, which is the difference between them. So you may have a situation where you have more people coming in than leaving, or you may have a situation where you have more people leaving than coming in. The UK has a very interesting history when it comes to migration. And over the last thousand years or even longer, we've seen many different groups from all over the world come and settle in the UK. But for now, we're going to focus on the last hundred years or so. So from 1900 to 1945, generally the largest immigrant group coming to the United Kingdom were the Irish. And it's worth remembering that at this point in time, at least for the first part of the 1900s, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, was part of the British Empire. So this was actually a form of almost internal migration. These were followed by Eastern and Central European Jews. And we need to remember and think about what was going on during that period of time. There was lots of upheaval in Central Europe, in particular as a result of the First and Second World Wars. Uh, we also saw the rise of anti-Semitism um, during this period, which caused many Jews to feel that they needed to migrate and find other places to live and settle. We also find that there was lots of Canadians and Americans coming and settling in the UK. And again, it's worth remembering that both Canada and America were historically part of the British Empire. So culturally, they're very similar to the United Kingdom. And we often found that there are sort of familial connections. And so this is why many were coming over to the UK to settle. After the Second World War, however, we see a change in migration patterns to the UK. It's worth remembering that the Second World War had economically devastated what was then the British Empire, and the country was in ruins and needed to be rebuilt. And so the politicians of the time decided to make changes to migration policy and throw open the doors to invite people from all over the world, from all over parts of the empire, to come to the UK to help rebuild the motherland. And so at first, we see tens of thousands of Caribbeans coming to the UK and settling, starting businesses, uh, doing the jobs, starting to rebuild that economy. It's very successful and effective policy. From the 1960s, we see a change. We start to see large numbers of South Asians, in particular Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis and Sri Lankans, coming to the UK and doing a very similar thing. So starting businesses, taking on jobs, starting families and settling within to uh, UK society and adding to its rich mix. Britain has also seen significant numbers of migrants from other ex-British colonies in parts of Africa who have come and done a similar thing. And so we've now got by the sort of 1970s a far more multicultural society than perhaps what had existed prior to 1945 in the UK. From the 1980s onwards, we see a bit of a change again. Non-white immigration accounts for a little over a quarter of immigration to the UK today. And that's because actually we start to see lots more of Eastern Europeans or Europeans in general coming to the UK and settling. And as the European Union has expanded, we've then had new countries with new groups of people who have the right as a result of being EU citizens to come and settle and work work in the UK. Now, what this is going to mean in the future when the UK leaves the European Union, we don't know. So we may see a change to migration patterns once again. In terms of emigration, an interesting fact to consider is that from the mid 16th century until the 1980s, so still very recently, the UK was almost always a net exporter of people, which means that more people left than arrived. So this has only very recently changed. The main reasons for emigration are generally economic in nature. So you have what they call push factors. This is something that would push someone out of their home country. So it could be that the country is going through an economic recession or depression, perhaps there's mass unemployment. And so someone leaves to go and live and work in a society that isn't suffering from those economic ills. 
We also have pull factors, so things that actually pull someone to a country. So in particular, if we know that the jobs there are paying more than the, perhaps they pay here, there's a kind of natural inclination to perhaps want to go do that job elsewhere to earn more money. There may also just be better job opportunities. Perhaps there's certain sectors that are growing in certain countries, and so people may be interested in going over there, retraining, and getting jobs in that area. This has changed in recent times, however, so some migrate for political and religious reasons, so it's not always purely economic. And we think about some of the struggles and upheavals in the world at this point in time or over the last sort of five to ten years or so. In particular, a good example could be the civil war in Syria. We've seen large numbers of Syrian migrants come to Europe and settle, in particular in places like Germany. In terms of recent and future migration patterns, from 1994 to 2004, both immigration and emigration increased. The EU has made access to immigration easier and the ability to move anywhere within the European Union, settle, get a job, become educated, this sort of thing, has incentivized the movement of peoples. And in particular, we find that most migrants are young males and they're looking for jobs. Uh, that said, though, they may be looking to study as well. And in the UK, we do find large numbers of foreign students come to the UK because the UK is known as having a good education system, in particular at a higher education level. That said, though, some people move for retirement. And actually, we see a large number of people come from the UK to places like Spain, and they often retire in the warmer climate. We also need to think about the effect this has on the dependency ratio. It actually reduces the dependency ratio to have higher immigration because if we have more people coming to the UK, say, and they are young males or young people who are going to start families, start working, paying taxes, that's going to actually help pay for those high, um, elderly people who perhaps are using our services more, but also for children as well. We also know that these people will be bringing a higher fertility rate with them. And so therefore, with more children, again, the hope will be that they'll go on to settle, have jobs, pay taxes and so on. So helping with that dependency ratio and ageing population issue. That said, though, of course, you know, with more children, that means that policy implications need to be considered. We're going to need more schools and that sort of thing as well. Overall, it reduces the average age of the population and produces more workers to have a high immigration rate. Now, we need to consider the effects of globalisation on migration. Globalisation is producing increased migration. And by globalisation, we mean that the world feels smaller, the world is more increasingly interconnected and interdependent. From 2000 to 2013, we saw 33% rise in migration globally. And this is something that is continuing to rumble on um, since 2013. We need to consider also and engage in what we call differentiation. There are many different types of migrants from everything from permanent settlers, so people who are looking to make a permanent move, never to move ever again, to temporary workers, people who are literally going to jump across into a different country, maybe for a couple of months or even a couple of years for a particular job. You also need to consider perhaps if someone moves abroad uh, with a job and they settle and they have a spouse perhaps in, a, in their homeland or in their home country, they may eventually want to bring that person across and maybe even their family as well, their children if they have some. We also have refugees, so people who are fleeing persecution, people who are no longer safe in their country for one reason or another, perhaps fleeing famine or civil war, and asylum seekers as well, so people who say that the government is actively trying to oppress them and they need to be protected. Now, in this situation, you will find that most are legal and have a right to do so, or at the very least can claim their human rights and say that they need asylum. However, there will be some who are not, who do not have the rights, and they who have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis uh, by the varying governments to the countries in which they have moved. This has now led to what many are referring to as super diversity. This is to say that migrants now come from many more countries around the world, not just, in the UK's example, British ex-colonies. And as a result, they have different legal status. So we saw in that brief history, we had people coming primarily from sort of ex-British colonies or parts of the empire. Today, that's no longer the case. They're coming from all over the world, all different countries for all different reasons. We also find there's a class element here that needs to be considered. So class differences... Uh, exist amongst migrants and it's Robin Cohen who distinguishes actually three different types of migrants. So firstly you have citizens who have full rights, that is to say they have absolutely right, every right to come say live and settle in the UK. So someone from France with a French passport has every right to come and live and settle in the United Kingdom and to work and to learn and so on. They would be a citizen. 
You then have denizens. Now, denizens may not have full rights. They may come from, say, outside the European Union, if we're focusing on the UK, but they may be privileged in some way. They may be middle or upper class. They may be a wealthy, a wealthy business person or own a business of some description. And actually, some governments may consider, well, it's in our interest to have this person coming over here, starting a business or opening a business because they're going to add money to the tax coffers. And so they may, for example, modify the rules to give them some sort of status, to give them rights to come and live and work, say, in the UK. However, you also have a group which are referred to by Cohen as helots. Um, this is an ancient Greek word. These are a disposable workforce of unskilled labourers who are generally very poorly paid. And this is where we often find large numbers of illegally trafficked workers. Now, it's not unusual, even in the United Kingdom, sadly, for us to see um, human slavery take place and modern day slavery occur. Uh, in particular, we've often found that there have been um, hired farmhands, so people who come over and do agricultural work for a couple of months or a year or so, who may have been smuggled into the UK, not have the official papers or rights to be here. And once their work is done, they're then essentially left on their own to go either find their way home or find some way to legalise or naturalise themselves. Some sociologists have identified a feminization of migration. That is to say that almost half of all global migrants are female, uh, which is a new trend. This wasn't always the case. Traditionally or historically, migration was primarily a male uh, activity. This has resulted in the globalization of a gender division of labor. We're finding that the jobs that are in demand or um, the areas where there are lots of new jobs being created and there's lots of demand for new workers tend to be jobs which are seen as feminized. So, for example, female migrants are given stereotype roles such as carers or providers of sexual services. So we do have an aging population in the UK. Therefore, we need lots more carers, people working in care homes. This tends to be women. And these jobs being poorly paid tend to attract female migrants from abroad to come to the UK and settle to do them for various reasons. Also, you're thinking about the more kind of illicit and illegal or deviant aspect of our society. We generally find that most prostitutes that work in the United Kingdom often uh, come from some foreign extraction. So they've moved from some part of the world to the UK to engage in that activity. And now it may be that they have been uh, smuggled or trafficked. It may be that they've decided to do it of their own volition. This focus on migration has led some sociologists to consider what effect or impact this may be having on migrants' identities. And so two different migrant identities are identified. Firstly, hybrid identities. This is where migrants develop a hybrid or mixture identity from two or more different sources. So say, for example, an individual is born in Finland and they grow up and they feel very much Finnish. But at some point in their life, perhaps they decide to go and live and work and settle in Germany. They may, over a period of time, build a hybrid identity. That is, they feel partially Finnish and partially German. You can also have transnational identities. So globalization creates back and forth movements of people rather than permanent settlement in another country. So it's not unusual today for people to move uh, across uh, multiple different countries uh, at different points in their lives or uh, at one point in their life. It could be that, for example, an individual works in one country and flies back home at a weekend to a different country or that they may work in uh, one country for a number of months a year, then another one, then another one and so on in a kind of rolling process. As a result, migrants may therefore adopt or develop a transnational identity. Um, this is when it's kind of they're a mixture of many different identities and of none at the same time. Also, because of modern technology, it makes it possible to sustain global ties without having to travel. So you can pick up your phone, you can jump online, send an email, send an instant message, you can FaceTime or Skype, and you can maintain relationships with people all over the world simultaneously. And as a result of that, this is going to affect and change an individual's identity. They may feel somewhat transient, that is that they're not rooted in one particular place, but in a number of places. Now, migration is a hot topic when it comes to politics. States have their own policies on migration. And generally speaking, the view has been, in particular in the West, with, this, with the seeking to control migration, that is to keep its numbers down. And in particular, there's often been concerns about cultural diversity and whether or not this is a positive thing or a negative thing. Immigration policies have also become linked to national security and anti-terrorism policies. So some 
politicians have had the view that perhaps um, migration needs to be restricted from certain countries around the world because there's concerns that perhaps it's in those countries that we find um, terrorist activity occurring or people being radicalised and so one perhaps wouldn't want those individuals coming to say the UK and engaging in those sorts of activities. However, this is often kind of counterbalanced with a desire for assimilation. These are when governments introduce policies aimed to encourage immigrants to adopt, say, the new language, the new values and the customs of the host country. So if someone was coming to the UK, say, from parts of the Middle East or Asia, if they were to assimilate, that means they would seek to try to become more British, as it were. An alternative approach rather than assimilation is multiculturalism. And actually in the United Kingdom, at least up until very recently, this has been the approach that's been adopted by multiple and consecutive governments. And to an extent, most would argue it's been very successful. This is where policies accept that migrants may wish to retain a separate cultural identity. So you've moved to the UK, but actually you're very happy where you came from. You had a particular identity and you want to maintain that. You may take on some aspects of British culture, but you want to kind of remain rooted in your traditional or um, home country's identity. This acceptance may be limited to superficial differences. It may just be that you know you want to continue to eat a certain type of food that you ate at home uh, wherever home was. And that type of diversity would be considered kind of shallow diversity, rather than more sort of fundamental or deep diversity issues such as the veiling of women. So in particular here we're talking about those coming from Arabic or Islamic countries who bring with them the culture perhaps of wearing the veil, the hijab and the cap and this sort of thing. Now in the UK that's not part of um, British culture and so therefore that might be seen as a, a more kind of divisive thing. However, as time's gone on, multiculturalism has led to greater acceptance and liberalisation of attitudes and understanding. And so as a result, it's something that's um, perhaps more prevalent today than it was in the past. Furthermore, assimilation policies are arguably counterproductive because they mark out ethnic minority groups as being different, as being another. And therefore, minorities may respond by emphasising their difference. They may feel like they're being picked upon, that they're being forced to assimilate, and it may cause them to kind of double down and entrench themselves and be more like their original culture or their home culture. This increases the host's suspicion of them, making assimilation less likely. So if they do engage in that behaviour, there's kind of this uh, response from the host country saying, well, why don't you want to take on, say, British culture? And that might increase suspicion and start to cause division and problems and conflict. Assimilation ideas may also encourage workers to blame migrants for problems such as unemployment. Um, and this has not been unusual. So in, amongst our working classes, often a fear or concern is whipped up by our media that perhaps migrants are coming to the UK and taking your jobs. Um, however, there doesn't appear to be much evidence of that. This benefits capitalism in particular, Marxists would argue, because it helps to divide the working classes against each other. So if instead, you know, these migrant workers and the, if you will, indigenous workers were to bandy together and form a common front and form class consciousness, perhaps they could challenge capitalism and create a better society. So these are the views that Marxists would hold. That's it. Thank you very much.